got these four revolvers broken down as far as I'm gonna break them down let me tell you that was a that was a royal pain in the butt doing all of them like that sure hope you appreciate this okay I have the standard the USFA premium Uberti rooster shooter and third generation 1983 manufactured Colt single action army you'll notice that I've removed the ejector rod housings on the Uberti and the Colt, I did not on the USFA or the standard. Uh, I guess I'll get this out of the way first. I didn't on these two because they're exactly like the Uberti in construction. One of the things that Colt always did and still does is they always had a locating boss that was staked in place on the side of their barrel. The very earliest ones had a, a locating boss and then also the screw screwed into the barrel. Uh, it didn't take them long before they just adopted a locating boss with a hole drilled out and threaded for the screw that secures the ejector rod housing on there. Um, this is a superior way to do it, I think. Your screw can get a little bit loose, a little bit loose, and it's still going to hold that ejector rod housing against uh, recoil. Hold it more securely. Uberti and USFA and Standard just drilled a hole into the barrel and threaded it for the screw that uh, secures the ejector rod housing. So that's a change between all of them. You have Colt forged frame, the Verity forged frame, and USFA and standard frames milled out of billet. Um, it's going to be hard to have the camera on all four all the time, so we're just going to have to take them one at a time. I won't spend a whole lot of time on the frames. I think uh, some of the small parts are more interesting. But Here's a Colt frame from the early 1980s. Uh, I don't. I had one from 2009. Very, very similar in terms of the machining. You've got some uh, some machine marks that are certainly uh, evident in it. But look at those lovely, lovely color case. Though so, uh, you can see the recoil plate that's staked in on all Colts and uh, also on USFA and standard with a small hole in it for the small diameter firing pin. You, typically you'll have a, a, a square, fairly square cylinder window on, on a Colt. Uh, it's been carefully, carefully broached out. Uh, you've probably seen or heard me mention this, the, uh, the step in the recoil shield where it goes from generous headspace to tighter headspace, and that's represented in this one by uh, you can tell the little lip, the little line there. Uh, it's fairly smooth though, fairly ramped, so the rounds don't don't catch on it. But that's typical. It's hard to say that there's a whole lot typical about the third gen Colts because I did say that their quality was kind of all over the map, but. That's how they that's how they made their frames. You can see the well, they drilled the hole for the barrel. You can see the little screw threads um, you know mark right there. You won't find that typically on Uberti and I'll explain in a minute why you won't. Uh, the inside of the frame you also have machine marks. I'm sorry about the oil. I, I didn't dry these out completely. Um, you can have a fairly clean revolver and then you break it down and find all this dried and congealed oil, but uh, 
fairly smooth on the inside and uh, you can see some machine marks but not too many fairly fairly smooth a lot of the early Italian guns that I had and that I saw were really really rough machine marks inside but you can see some of them some of them there on this Colt <coughs> Duberti. In contrast, uh, it, of course, it's also a forged frame that's machined. You'll often have, I think always have, not a perfectly square window. You can usually see a, a little diagonals right here in the corners. Um, that's just how they make theirs. You don't typically see thread marks from where they drilled the barrel hole and made the threads and why is that because Uberti and the USFA and the standard have a larger frame window for that slightly larger diameter cylinder so the barrel doesn't really contact the very top of the frame like that you do not have that you see a circle there that's just an imprint from case heads and 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 primers that is not a separate staked in recoil bushing that's just machined flat with a hole drilled in it uh, you know use plenty of machine marks you have that step there where it goes from generous headspace to then tighter headspace and on a lot of berries you have a very pronounced lip right there I didn't test this one I don't test them all for that but what that can you're not really supposed to be pointing a muzzle at the sky when you cock it but if it is pointing up uh, the rounds on their way up can can catch the, the case heads can catch on that a little bit cause a little hitch uh, when you're cocking it I usually on a barity will stone that smooth inside the frame pretty good machining you can see this stamp upside down here but you can see that stamp is uh, 2015 so that's when this one was made so fairly recent um, and you know pretty good machining on the inside they're doing they're doing a good job on their frames on their on their single action army copies that's that's pretty good machining there a lot of you I used to see were really really rough in that area and uh, not so much anymore so kudos to them for doing a, a good machining job on that mm, not really much else to talk about on that on that frame except you see a you see a screw here I've just replaced it because it's a tiny screw but that screw is present on Uberti's and on Pietas don't have a screw but they do have a hole right there that's because of their plunger modification that they make where they replace the flat hand spring with just a coil spring they have a little coil spring it pushes on a plunger and it is held in place by this screw but it goes to the back of that this plunger pushes on the back of the of the hand on Uberti and a Pieta and that's what provides the spring tension on a hand rather than having a, a traditional flat spring that's mounted to the back of the hammer like on this USFA back of the hand like on this USFA hand and like standard and like Colt a little more friction on this hand spring running up and down inside that channel so it's usually harder to get as slick a feeling action with a traditionally manufactured one rather than with this plunger arrangement that Uberti and Pieta use on to the USFA frame of course this is a black powder style frame so it secures the base pin with a screw through the bottom of the frame rather than being having a screw coming in from the side that's spring-loaded 
that secures it. Typically, I have found very, very smooth machining on the USFAs, and this one is no exception. It's going to be smoother machining inside than on either the Colt or the Uberti. Uh, a lot fewer machine marks uh, to refresh your memory. Here's a Colt. Plenty of uh, machine marks. There's USFA. They're not nearly as prominent. You have staked in recoil plate for the firing pin to pass through and it is larger diameter for the larger diameter firing pin. The hole is. Quick refresher. This is the Colt with a smaller hole. This is USFA with a larger hole. That step that I talked about, you don't really see that step on the side of the, the recoil shield. It does go from loose headspace to tight headspace, but they did it very, very gradually, so there's no chance that a, a round can catch on there. Um, again, on the, on the range, I didn't notice anything with the Uberdes uh, or the Colts catching there. Uh, I've just noticed it when on some when I would point them to the sky and just cock the hammer just to see, and it, it would catch. Don't know how big of a problem it is. Inside, good machining. Uh, fairly, fairly smooth. Similar to that uh, Uberi, you know how smooth it was right here. You know, the Colt had some, uh, some, you could see some machine marks coming down this way from it. Uh, very good, very good machining. Don't have any type of stamp on the inside, never did, to say what year that they were made. You just had to go by the, what we've learned by the serial number ranges for the USFA premiums. Uh, this serial number range falls into, toward the end of production. And of course this was ordered in, in 2010 by the guy that bought it. You also will see a, a more square window for the cylinder in the frame than on a parity. You don't have such prominent angles right there on the corners of the frame but it is a larger frame window than Colt because they used Uberti sized cylinders so again the barrel uh, when they were drilling the barrel you didn't have it cut into the frame at all of course no hole for the plunger because it didn't have a plunger it uses the traditional flat handspring and lastly a standard frame made very very much like Uberti. Again very very much like USFA. Uh, again very very smooth machining on the inside and no visible step uh, where it goes from loose to, to tight so I like that. Again I'm sorry about all the oil I didn't have time to just dry these out completely but you have good, you, know, you see machine marks, but they're, they're very, very light. Um, of course, you can still see that little dimple on the recoil plate where uh, the firing pin used to strike it before they addressed that issue. And again, you don't have any cuts in the top of the frame there where they drilled out the barrel hole and threaded it. Of course, no hole for any plunger. You do have, what I noticed earlier, lightly struck the serial number or engraved the serial number here. I'm sure that was before they did the final stamping on the front. Um, pretty smooth on the inside. Saw a, I don't know, a hint of maybe slightly more machine marks on the inside right here than I did on the USFA or even the Berti. I would say this probably varies from gun to gun. 
Now, one thing I wanted to point out that I noticed, because there's a lot of people that say, that claim, or at least opine, that despite standards claims, they used exactly the same program as USFA. And I have noticed some differences in just the way they shaped their frames. On the USFA, the back of the top strap I can explain this. It plunges down and this intersecting line just meets it. On the standard, it doesn't plunge down as far in the back at the top. And this line here on the side actually comes up slightly to meet it. So that is probably if I sit them back to back, you can see that they are they are different in that area. So I guess that's one way if you see a see a picture, somebody says, is this a standard or not? Uh, you can kind of tell, yeah, they're they're a little bit different there in the back. They're also a little different in the front with the way that this curve goes. It's more gradual of a curve where on the standard it is a little bit of a sharper, sharper curve. Not much of a difference, but I've gotten to where I can kind of spot that pretty quickly. Um, otherwise, they're machined very, very similarly. All right, we've got the frames out of the way. On to some of the smaller parts. I'm going to talk first, I guess, about some of the cast parts that you'll find on a Liberty. People wonder why would you pay so much more for USFA or for standard. Is there any difference in a cast grip frame assembly in terms of performance? No, you don't have to make them out of forged steel. You don't have to make them milled out of bar stock. They don't have to be all that strong. Uh, you can make them out of brass. It doesn't really matter. But some people like if a part has been fully machined out of bar stock versus something that was cast first and then finished machined. So how, how can I tell this is cast? Well, one way, um, my forged parts will look like this too sometimes, but happen to know pretty sure that you barely cast theirs. But typically you'll have this rough surface finish on the parts that don't show, on the parts that don't matter so much. Um, you can see it here too, this pockmarked surface. It's not going to be smooth for machining. They don't need to machine that smooth. It doesn't show. It's on the inside. But yeah, rough there. Nice big void right here. Probably because it didn't need to be filled, but that's obviously cast. And kind of rough down in here. You can see it's obviously just it's a cast part that they then finish machine. They do a pretty good job finish machining it. I mean, it's that's attractive and it does have the bevels. And these actually are, are sharper than some of the ones that I've seen on some of Barity's. And one thing the Barity typically does is they also machine this little bevel, which a lot of the early Colts had. USFA didn't. Standard doesn't. Colt certainly doesn't, but they did. And on their back strap, also, you can tell cast. You can even see a, a little line right there uh, where the casting was. Well executed, but again, a casting, and that matters to some people. I guess in the same way that, you know, I don't know. Would you rather have a diamond or a cubic zirconium? I mean, it just, most people can't tell the difference looking at them, but just knowing it kind of matters to them. They construct theirs very differently than Colt does, than USFA did, and that Standard does. In two areas that stood out. One, they actually cast in a little seat here for the trigger, I guess, to position itself against. So all the screws really doing is holding this down. It's not holding it. Laterally. I don't know if that matters at all. They, they, Colt's not like, nobody else is like this. And their locating pin for the grips is back here in the back strap. I guess 
to some people, I guess if you had tight fitting grips for some reason, two piece grips and they didn't want to come off, you could unscrew this, unscrew these two, pull this whole assembly off, and of course the grips would slide off with it and then you could pull them off. Maybe that's an advantage they see, I don't know. And the pin is on this particular one easily removed by hand. Not necessarily a good thing. Uh, my buddy that sent me this said he he sent it to me the way they the way he got it was convinced that they do some some things to theirs either at Cimarron or maybe Uberti does it. Um, I noticed it did have a lighter mainspring than uh, a lot of the other ones. Well, there's kind of a cheat that is a split washer here underneath the screw. I don't think my buddy put that in there. That's how he got it. I think he got it new or new old stock so I don't think this is some gunsmith's addition to lighten it. Maybe just be something Cimarron does. Um, so that is cast Liberty complete grip frame assembly. Colt meets them I guess halfway. Certainly don't want to get these mixed up huh? Alright and this is Colt and the back strap assembly entirely machined. Now you can see the, the machine marks. Uh, they're light, but you can see them in there. They did a pretty good job on the back strap ears, but kind of like how Uberti does it, this corner down in here is kind of soft. And it's even softer on this 1983 Colt. Colt has been doing a little better since then on their backstrap ears. Like I say, I have seen some third generations where there was not even a curve that way. This just went straight down like that. And the holes would get really, really dished out. You see this, the screw heads protruding way out. So they had a they had a challenge in shaping this part. I don't know why there were just some guys at Colt that didn't seem to understand what that was supposed to look like. The old timers are retired I guess and never passed on that that knowledge. But yeah all machined and I think from forgings and I'm not exactly sure on that. But by the third generation they were going to a cast trigger guard assembly and Gone were the bevels on the sides, and instead it was just all rounded over like that. A lot of people that they don't care about that. I always like the way those look. It's all rounded, all rounded from here. There's no flats in there. It was just all rounded over, um, and the, the front you'll often see is this line right here will be rounded. Whereas I call it Uberti. You know, that's a that's a straight line because this is more or less this is more or less flat, slight curve to it, but more or less flat with the bevels. And Colt didn't have that. Hard to tell this is a casting because there's so much finished machining that they did to it. So rather than like on the Uberti, where you had this rough pebbly surface from being cast. Colt did a lot of finish machining on theirs, um, on both sides. And the only way to really know that it's cast is when you look at this surface here, and you can see the, the casting line. Uh, you can see the pebbly surface there. Right. But everything else that mates up is machined, which is nice. This area here, I did that. I had trouble with a replacement mainspring. Wanted to actually bottom out on the frame there, so I just had to file that off. It didn't matter because it was inside and wouldn't show. So that is Colt. So I guess medium halfway. Partly forged the machine, partly cast. On to USFA. Both pieces entirely machined out of bar stock. Oh, also forgot to mention the Colt locating pin for the grips was on the on the trigger guard assembly. 
the pin on this was loose and just kind of came out with the grip, so I left it attached to the grip. That's a locating pin. Okay, USFA. Put their locating pin, same place as Colt. Guess we'll talk about the back strap first. All machined and very, very nicely machined. Uh, don't see very many machine marks. It's fairly smooth, very nicely done. <laughs> Compare that to that partially machined one that I had, you know, where they where they took this and, and turned it into this. A lot of a lot of finish. Finish machine to do. But I can kind of see where why this part here was a a reject or something. You can see that it's it's much, much thinner. So I guess they had something out of spec. Or, cutter slipped or something I don't know you can see why that's not just partially finished part it was a that was a reject but it was too thin in, in certain places backtrack the ears always shaped very well on USFA nice nice curves there and a nice well-defined corner right here nice graceful curve over here met this nice sharp corner uh, the screw heads usually sunk in nice and deeply in there didn't protrude overall very nice nicely machined and the trigger guard assembly same thing obviously not a casting all machined and very very well machined Remember the depression, the pebbly void depression on the on the Uberti didn't exist on USFAs. Probably the best out of all of them. Uh, trigger guard assembly. The shape underneath mostly flat. Flat bevel here instead of that big round thing on a Colt. Nice, sharp flat bevels on the side and uh, remember that partially finished one that I had we had this it was flat under here at first looked like kind of a bit of undercut you can see a little line right there they went back afterward and machined that down this area that was protruding machined it down flat along with the rest of it so that was how they that was how they finished theirs. Very nice, very nice trigger guard assembly. Now on to the standard. Same thing with the back strap. Really can't tell any difference at all between this and at USFA very very nicely machined uh, very nicely well-defined curves on your back strap ears sharp corner graceful curve very very nicely done and also their trigger guard assembly you can see you can't really feel it's just you can see the little swirly marks from the machining um, Again, the locating pin for the grips, and this one's nice and tight, nice and well secured. Locating pin on the actual trigger guard assembly rather than the back strap like the Barity does. Nice and smooth on top. A little less or different finishing than new Barity. A little undercut that they make when they're rounding that out in there. They left that, they didn't come back later on and, and take that down flat, which makes the bevel on the side thicken a little bit right there very nice nicely cut bevels on the sides I like their their bevel cutting more than USFA so there we have grip frame assembly on to the cylinders this is a Barity cylinder sorry if it looks a little dingy I, I did clean this one but it's had so many rounds through it even before I shot it that I wasn't going to scrub all these lead marks off of the front. Uh, does have the removable base pin bushing and nicely executed bevels. Uh, people sometimes call these black powder bevels, but 
the first gen Colts, early Colts, had these nice bevels. You know, what are they there for? Well, people said to ease of holstering. I think it just it made it look nice. And uh, this is an attractive looking cylinder. Both Uberti and Pieta do a nice job with these. It's not just putting this on a lathe and, and turning it uh, because these aren't just flat cut. They're actually curve around like that. I don't know how they how they do that, frankly. I don't think they sit there by hand against a, a wheel and do it. It's probably some sort of fixture. Um, not much of a groove here in this this is sometimes referred to as a gas ring. You know, when the, the gas would escape through the barrel cylinder gap, it was supposed to just hit that and kind of deflect it up rather than allow it to get down in around the base pin. It's, on the Berties, it's rather a shallow groove. I guess you could argue that that means that there's a little bit more meat in the front where it actually contacts the front of the frame. Maybe they do that on purpose so that it doesn't crush or, or wear out as easily. I don't know. It's different. I'm going to demonstrate that in a bit. This is the Colt cylinder. Third gen. Some people say there's now a fourth generation, but it's still basically third generation Colt. Uh, this base pin bushing is removable, but it doesn't go all the way through, and you'd have to actually drive that out. It's actually... Um, pressed into place so it looks the same as the other ones much much deeper groove for the gas ring but you know it's this hole is just the same size as the base pin so this this only goes in so far it's only about about that that long um, all newer Colts now have a fully removable base pin bushing that goes all the way through just like the Uberity just like the older Colts but their cylinder bevels, they changed this long time ago. They just went to a regular old, kind of a, a shallow and just something where this was on a lathe and a cutter just machined that down. Not a graceful curve at all like Uberti, Pieta, anybody else. But that's a Colt cylinder from most of your third gen production. I don't remember what year it was that they went to the removable base pin bushing again. Maybe early 2000s or late 90s. But. USFA cylinder. Fully removable base pin bushing. You can see a very, very deep cut right there in that gas ring. Doesn't leave as much meat. On the front, I don't think that matters. That's how the original Colts were. That's what they've copied. <clears throat> and as a reminder, how different the Uberti looks. And it's a different shape there. See, this is much deeper cut, much more shallow of a cut. Uh, one way that you can often tell a Uberti cylinder, if you're looking at a, an older USFA and you're wanting to know, is this an old USA made or is this a... Is this a, a Oberity cylinder that they've used? Is the way that the flutes look. The Verity is more like modern Colt. It tends to be a sharper, sharper flute. It seems to looks like it extends a little bit further. If you're looking at the area between the two cylinder stop notches, looks like it protrudes a little bit, a little bit further. And it's a sharper nose right there. Whereas USFA, it's a little bit more rounded and doesn't seem to protrude as far. So that's one way, quick glance, if you see somebody with a USFA for sale and you see a cylinder that has a sharper nose, it's definitely a Uberti cylinder, not a USFA. This Uberti has nice, round, uh, pretty, much more severe bevels than the USFA, but... USFA did put a nice first gen bevel on it that does it is curved, just not as curved as Uberti or Pieta. Uh, we saw a lot of first generation Colts like this. That just gradually got less of a curve as Colt went on and eventually they abandoned it altogether. But uh, yeah, the USFA does have pretty nice curve in there. You see it it stands out more on the uh, 
on their rodeos. Yep, USFA cylinder. And lastly, we have standard manufacturing. And like USFA and Colt, now and Uberti, uh, removable base pin bushing. It's deeply cut like Colt, like USFA. Uh, looks a little bit different on the flutes than Uberti. A little bit. A little bit different. Not quite as sharp as Uberti but not quite as rounded, I don't think. Well, there's USFA on top, there's standard on the bottom. I guess they're pretty much the same. So, interesting, I hadn't noticed that before. But, like Colt, standard did not attempt to do any sort of curve on their, bell, on their cylinder bevels. They're just flat across like Colt does now and has done for a long time. Uh, other than that, very, very close to USFA. Hammers. So, Barity Hammer. They're putting a kind of a, it's, it's a pretty nice feeling, sharp checkering, but that is a laser cut checkering. Um, I don't know how well it'll show up on camera here, but that is not any kind of hand cut. You can see up close, you can see it's just, it's been laser cut. Um, it's pretty attractive, not as deep as a hand cut, but because of all the little, little tiny burrs that are left from that process, it makes for a sandpapery kind of sharp, good gripping surface for your thumb. So in terms of usability, it looks pretty good and it is very usable. It's not traditional though in how it's made. My understanding is Uberti uses cast hammers. Still look pretty good. This is an older style of hammer. Uberti doesn't put these on anything else. I don't think that they're importing now. They have a funky little safety in them. People hate them. But the lawyers finally won on that. This is an, an older Uberti hammer. The hammer cam is machined integrally as part of the hammer. See on the back there's no nothing to indicate, no round circle, anything to indicate that that was a pin that's driven in. Just machined integrally into that. Uh, kind of rounded in the corners. You'll see a difference when I show you some other hammers. Uh, other than that, pretty nice hammer overall. It does have the uh, we called it the floating firing pin, but it, it, it can wiggle around in there so it can more easily find its way through the hole. And this hole right here in the back is to remove that. Uh, you drove out a pin, kind of hard to see the light, you drove out a pin that secured the firing pin and then drove the firing pin out through the back end. So that's Uberti Hammer. Hole hammers, all machined out of bar stocks, far as I know. You can see that pin that secures my firing pin on this one is actually almost a floating pin in itself. It's kind of moving around there. Uh, this particular example wasn't particularly very well done. Uh, doesn't rub on the frame, but don't know why, because you can actually feel it there. I had on my 2009. I didn't. I didn't have that. Um, Again, floating firing pin. It does wiggle and actually wiggles even more than the Verity. Hammers machined out of bar stock. Sorry about all the crud I left on these. Just You can clean a firearm or revolver really well. I think you've got it clean. Then you break it down to its integral parts and you find all kinds of crud left behind. The cam on a Colt was a separate hardened pin that was pressed in. You can see the circle on the back side indicating that I like that I like being able to remove that and replace it uh, sometimes when you're timing one and sometimes it's the last thing you can do if you're having problems with the bolt timing how the bolt falls off this leg is you can actually 
take the pin out and clock it a little bit so that the as the bolt legs falling off as the hammer is cocking it and it's lifting that bolt leg and then the bolt leg finally falls off I guess as it gets closer and closer to this diminishing surface where you have this angle here that there can become a time where that might actually fall there instead of there so you can sometimes turn this slightly to the right and that'll allow a little longer purchase on the bolt leg before it might slip over the side uh, might actually fall the way it's supposed to so that's why I like those it can be a nice hardened pin harder than the hammer itself um, if you have a nice hard internal parts I just I like having a removable cam like that Colt for a long time unless you were special uh, do not color case harden their hammers they just blued them they're blued on the bottom blued in the front and they polished them white on the sides uh, and the checkering has varied on Colts over the years on their whole third gen run this particular era of them a lot of guys don't like the way they look because they had sort of this flat area right here that's distinctive to a lot of people that that shape was unattractive to them real collectors will spot that immediately and go oh yeah I know exactly when that cult was made just because it's got that sometimes late 70s but especially early 80s you'll have that shape to it but it was, don't know how the knurling was made looks like it was cut probably on a knurling machine not really sure but very nice very nice checkering on that hammer so that's Colt hammer USFA now USFA had plenty of white sided hammers too but you could also order special on this and on the rodeo color case so the guy that ordered this one from him ordered it in color case and it's very very attractive I think like a Berti, USFA did not attempt to do any sort of removable cam on theirs it was also machined in integral to the hammer that was one of the biggest disappointments I had when I discovered that about USFA's I always figured they'd make them just like Colt uh, other than that, well made, and they did bring back the coned and fully fixed, that doesn't move at all, firing pin, secured by a pin to the side, and you had to hole in the back to drive it out if you ever had to remove it. In this particular example, you don't see any signs of any reworking on it afterward. They got this right, uh, the geometry was right, and... Made it really attractive. Not all of them were like this. They had different ways of doing their knurling, but I guess with this black powder frame style, they did a very old style uh, checkering on it where it was, it was bordered and uh, very, very nice. This is the nicest hammer I think I've ever had in terms of the, the overall execution of the knurling on the hammer. So same thickness all the way across. And they fit this so well that you don't see any rub marks or scraping on the side of the hammer from caulking. You just see a little bit of rotational stuff down here. I see a little hint of something right there. But overall, very nice. And enter standard. We talked about it in my standard review. They also went with the fixed coned firing pin. They do all color case and it's very, very attractive. I like that they do all color casing on their hammer. Uh, mentioned before, they seem to have some trouble with some of their early ones at least, and mine being among them, of getting the hammer fall, the firing pin lined up exactly right, and they had to go back and do some reworking. I said in my first video that I thought they had actually uh, filed that, cut it. I don't know. Whatever they did, they did it before color casing. But it almost looks turned up, and I've some I have since wondered if they actually didn't put this in a fixture and just beat on it until they knocked it up where it was supposed to be. I don't know. Regardless, it works fine. 
I don't know how they ever expect to remove this because there's no hole in the back. That escaped my attention the first time. It escaped my attention for a long time. Very different from how USFA did it, for sure. And they did use a removable pressed-in hardened cam. So I really, really like that they did that. And they also machined the sides down just a, just a hair. Just enough so that this will never touch the side of the frame and interfere with hammer fall or, or put scratches on it. So overall, very, very nice. The knurling on that, I said, was very reminiscent of what Colt is doing now. You look at a third gen Colt hammer, it looks almost exactly like that. Uh, very, very nicely, nicely checkered, nice knurling. So overall, I love their hammers. And I think subsequent subsequent guns won't have any reworking done on the firing pin. They'll get that right, but they've at least corrected that on mine and on a lot of the other earlier guns. My friend that got, I've seen other guys have remarked that they also had on some, on some of the guys that got the early ones had reworked firing pins there. Uh, loading gates. I'm told that Verdi, I was always told that they used a cast loading gate. I don't see evidence of this being a cast part. If it is a cast part, they had to do so much finish machining on it that they milled away any evidence of it being a cast part. Overall, that's, that's a nice looking loading gate. It doesn't fit as precisely, particularly back here and here. It doesn't fit as precisely in the frame as USFA or standard, but overall good looking loading gate on this Zuberti. Colt, I was told that Colt was casting their loading gates now and at least have been doing so for a fairly long time and I do see evidence of that. You'll see pebbly surface right here at the end of this pin. That, it looks like that was just raw casting surface there. Um, and I've seen a little bit right here in this area here. That's evidence to me that it's it's cast. Whether they're still doing that, I don't know. I suspect they are. I don't know why they would change that. Uh, still, like a Berti, I had to do a lot of finish machining, so those are the only areas that I could see evidence of it being cast. Um, I love the way they did their case coloring back then. Love all the pinks. Um, I'm going to leave this here for a second and just show you one of the differences. That, and of course it changes all the time. But look at the, the back part, the part you would actually grab. Uh, look at how much more meat is left on Uberti. It's just, it's shaped differently. It's frame the uh, loading gate window in the frame was different on this Colt in particular. Enter USFA. We saw on my other video when I was talking about parts that you know, obviously they hog theirs out of a piece of bar stock so definitely not cast. Very well fitting, well fitted gate. Uh, it's attractive. And they marked it with an assembly number. You notice it's not the same as the serial number at all. It was just an assembly number, and that assembly number is present on the scratch on the inside of the grips, is present on the frame on the grip strap. I didn't mention that earlier, I guess, but you know, here's the grip strap. Electro pencil 415. So they used an assembly number, sort of like how Colt used to do it. So there's a USFA loading gate. And lastly, standard, I also believe, well, they say it is, they say every part's machined out of bar stock, so I'm sure this is as well. Again, very, very nicely done. They mark theirs with the serial number, they use that as their assembly number. Uh, I did actually see if these would fit 
each other's frames and they actually do and they do quite well uh, so here's a standard frame with a USFA loading gate and the fit is very very close it's almost I'm not gonna force it but it's almost a perfect fit there um, and likewise maybe it was that I tried the standard in the the USFA frame. Certainly suggests that they there was some cooperation there. I mean that's that's that fits rather rather well. I haven't actually seen if what a Uberti loading gate if it would even fit in a USFA. Yeah, it, it, it does, but you can see shaped very differently. Huge gap right there. So that was loading gate. All right, we're, reaching, we're reaching the end here. We'll talk about bolts. This is an Uberti bolt. One thing that Uberti is doing, I guess they're taking a taking a hint from from the gunsmiths that work on these. One of the things, this leg right here is the springy part. This is what rides on the hammer cam. So when you cock the hammer, you're lifting that leg up, and when you lift the leg up, it pivots the head down. And it goes so far, and then finally that just snaps over that. And the spring pops the head back up. Then when you drop the hammer, this has to get back on top of this. So this is angled, and this is rather springy. And this leg has to spring back over this cam. So one thing a lot of gunsmiths will do to, to reduce any sort of interference in the hammer fall they'll actually make the cam a little bit shorter. They'll take some metal off this way so that it doesn't protrude out as far. Gotta be careful not to take it too much so that that leg doesn't have to spring quite as far to get it back over that. And another thing that they will do, and Uberti has done on this, is they've actually made the part that springs thinner than the part that doesn't. So the actual working leg of the bolt is actually thinner. Uh, and some gunsmiths will take that even thinner than that. It doesn't have to be very thick. Uh, the thinner it is, the less stress you're actually placing on the part because it springs more easily. Easier to bend a sapling than a big old branch, right? They do leave a rather sharp corner on the inside. A lot of gunsmiths will round that off because that's a stress riser. But that is a Uberti bolt. I'll leave that out there while I bring in the Colt 3rd Gen bolt. I don't want to get these screws mixed up. Here's a Colt 3rd Gen bolt. You can see they, they look a little different, don't they? Longer, longer legs on the back of the bolt. See this seat right here is thicker. There's some differences. And if you look at Colt, the springy part is just as thick as, you know, the working leg is just as thick as the non-working leg. And they also left it rather thick. I mean, they left it rather sharp. Uh, no, I take it back. They did not leave a sharp corner. They rounded the inside of that corner. So less, less chance of, even though the bolt leg is thicker, less chance of any breaking occur. And when breaking occurs, it often would occur right here. Sometimes it would occur at the actual screw hole, pin hole. But sometimes it would occur right here. So they've left that, left that rounded. So that is a Colt. I'm going to keep this Verdi up there. And on to USFA. If you look at USFA, it looks like they pretty much copied a Uberti bolt. So 
almost dimensionally identical to your Barity bolt. Uh, but I guess it wasn't known as a trick back then to leave the working leg thinner than the other leg, so they certainly didn't. But because they made it just like USFA, a nice sharp right here on the corner. I mean, because they made it like Uberti, a uh, sharp corner on the inside there. Otherwise, other than the bolt leg, both bolt legs being the same thickness, which Uberti's used to be, um, it's, for all intents and purposes, a Uberti bolt. That can be a nice thing, because if your bolt ever breaks, we do. You can order, go to VTI Gun Parts and order an Uberti bolt. And you can usually fit it to a USFA just fine. So there's your spare parts problem solved on a gun company that's no longer in business. Here is Standard's bolt. And also, dimensionally, just about the same as a Uberti bolt. It's nicely finished though, and unlike Verdi, it, its working leg is just as thick as the non-working leg. But, like Colt, they were at least aware of the potential problem of there being a sharp corner on the inside there, and so that area is rounded. So kudos to them for doing that. Um, and also, it suggests to me that should your standard, well, if mine ever breaks, I get to send it back to standard because I have, a, as long as they're still in business, because I have a, at least at least on the first ones ordered, it was a lifetime warranty. So if my bolt ever breaks, I guess I can send it back to them and they'll replace it. But if they ever go out of business and I need a bolt, again, I guess I can go to VTI Gun Parts and get a new Barity bolt and they should be able to fit it. just fine because they're for all intents and purposes functionally identical that's the bolts out of the way onto the hands these differ they differ quite a lot too this is one area obviously this is an Uberti hand there's no handspring attached to it don't know how they make their hands they're well finished they're smooth they have a unique shape to them in their in their teeth, different from Colt, different from anybody else. And of course, no flat spring along the back. Contrast that with a Colt third generation hand. The teeth are very, very different. Different than anybody else's that I've seen. And different from the first generation Colt hands, got a flat spring on the back, um, and these were machined out of bar stock. So, Colt third generation hand. I'm going to leave both of those up there, no chance of me getting those confused, and bring up a USFA hand. That's different than either one of those. This is very much like a first generation Colt hand. Again, it's got the flat spring, different, different tooth pattern. Obviously machined out of bar stock and you can see some, some rough machine. I don't know why, but they, they left some kind of rough machine marks on their hands. Um, so that's a USFA hand. And we'll contrast that, or in this case, compare that with standard hand which as far as I can tell is exactly the same way uh, that USFA made their hands again out of bar stock shaped like a first generation second generation coal hand um, and also I had to take this down a little bit there was some burring right here where it was rubbing on the side of the side of the hand window a little rougher machine than I would have expected in terms of finish smoothness uh, the Uberti actually has the, the nicer, the nicest hand of all of them. But yeah, standard hand, USFA hand, Colt hand, and a Uberti hand. 
I'll show the triggers, but there's really nothing to write home about on the triggers. There's a Barity trigger. It looks exactly the same as exactly the same as a Colt trigger, which looks exactly the same as a USFA trigger. which looks exactly the same as a standard trigger, except that the standard does nitro blue, some people call it fire blued. Sorry about the crud again on it, but they nitro blue their, their triggers. Well, that's, I guess, about it on the major parts comparisons between this standard and the others. I wish I had a Pieta to show you. Uh, I had one, and I'll tell you, it was fairly recent. It was made in 2016, I think, or 2015 or 16, and it was very poorly machined on the inside of the frame. I had to do a lot of fixing on it to actually even get it to work at all. So I don't know that you'll always have the consistency with the Italian ones. I wish I had a late model Colt to show you to do some compare. Uh, so sorry that this isn't as comprehensive a review or comparison as you might like, but I have my limitations. Ultimately, what does it come down to performance wise? Well, you saw on the range, uh, the standard certainly didn't seem to shoot any better, not much anyway. And it's arguable whether it was any better than really any of the other guns out there. Um, this Cimarron Rooster certainly shot very well, as did that 44 Special Uberti. It shot very, very well. You know, a, a cheap Casio Quartz Crystal Digital Watch that you buy in a drugstore is going to keep time as well as a Rolex. Maybe even better, don't know. Um, that's really kind of what you're what you're paying for anymore, I think, with a standard or USFA. Of course, Colt, you know, it's got the Colt name, Collector. There was a time when the Italian guns were had really soft internals and they just wore out so fast. They really were more like toys. You couldn't call them working guns. I think Uberti, at least at least Uberti, don't know about Pieta. They've really improved their internal parts. Um, I think a uh, Oberti make a fine working gun if you get one that's timed right. You know, see my my Thunderer video, and it wasn't timed right. Um, you can have issues with about anything. I really, really like this standard. It compares very, very favorable in terms of how it was constructed and the care with which it was constructed and the machining uh, as the very best USFAs. Uh, I treasure it because of that. Um, I treasure it because it's all U.S. made. I, I think we ought to be proud of our U.S. manufacturing. I would like that they can turn out such an attractive, um, well-machined product. I'm, I'm going to do a little tuning on this. I thought it's, its action can be smoother, and I know that I can do that. So I'll do a little bit of tuning on this, and I'll do a little bit of tuning on the USFA. It looks like i got a lot of tuning to do on that daggum USFA Rodeo and 44 Special. I'm going to have to do some cylinder honing. Some other work. It's timing is good, and its lockup is so nice and tight. It's, it's going to be a good gun when I get done with it. Yeah, this, this USFA 44 Special was probably the biggest disappointment on the range. And I guess I misremembered. I hadn't really paid enough attention to the chambers the first time I cleaned it. So I really wasn't expecting such sticky extraction. I'm going to have to hone these. Not looking forward to that. But I'll try to show you as best I can what we're talking about. When you look down inside the chambers, you see the concentric rings in there. You hear that? That's pretty rough. So what happens, that's not as bad 
That one's pretty rough. That one's pretty rough. That one's pretty rough. You know, so what happens, especially when you have any kind of soft brass, that brass fire forms to that chamber initially. And if these are at all tight chambers, which these probably are, it just really has a hard time letting go of them. You know, contrast that with, well, we'll just say this, this uh, rooster, You know, if you contrast that with this Uberti, you know, you don't have that, you can't really hear that, hear it scraping like that, can you? You know, they probably were a little bit looser chambers, and uh, boy, they just fell right out. You look at the, uh, at the USFA Premium, it had really, really, really smooth chambers. But yeah, this is, I'm going to end up having to hone these out. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Disappointing to see out of USFA, they were so finely crafted elsewhere. So, don't know what that was all about. Well, that's about it for this compare and contrast review. If you stuck around this long, you're probably better than most. I gotta get this, gave it a cleaning at the range, but it wasn't completely disassembled then. It's amazing how much gunk you find in the in the crevices. I'm not going to completely disassemble the 44 Special. He said I didn't have to clean his guns anyway, but I've already got this apart, so I guess its innards are going to get a good thorough scrubbing. But yeah, I can't think of really much else to say. I did, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, I did mentioned to him about how the range review went and the fact that this and the 44 special verity were shooting high which kind of surprised me because i knew he had sighted them in uh 44 special not too much because i was using a 250 grain bullet and i wasn't sure what kind of bullet he used but i assumed he was using 250 grain bullets in this as well because that's traditionally 45 Colt. I forgot that he had actually mentioned that he used a 230 grain bullet. So, uh, contrary to what your intuition might tell you, in a particularly a revolver like this, a heavier bullet is going to almost always, well, I can't think of any exception, it's going to print higher. And that's simply because the minute that bullet starts moving, the firearm starts recoiling. So the heavier the bullet, the greater the recoil. And when you look at the sights on a revolver, actually the tall side on the barrel is taller than just the difference in height between the top of the barrel and the top of the frame. It's actually when you're, when you're pointing a revolver barrel and sighting down the sights, if this is your line of sight for the sights, it's actually pointed more like this. And you're lining up the sights with your line of sight. And then as you shoot, as the bullet's making its way down the barrel, the revolver's actually recoiling a little bit. So that by the time it leaves the barrel, it's actually, the barrel is pointing at the target. So the heavier the bullet, the greater the recoil, and the more likely that you end up with it something like this by the time it exits the barrel. So he had he had adjusted and fouled his sights for elevation for a 230 grain bullet. Uh, these were both, both of his Uberities were excellent for windage, uh, which is pretty nice to see. Again, out of the box, that's, that's nice to see. I have turned my share of Uberity barrels that were not that were either printing left or printing right and had to turn them. That means either screwing them in slightly or unscrewing them ever so slightly. And by slightly, I mean very slightly. Doesn't take much clocking to affect that. But the fact that he got these from the factory dead on for windage is pretty good. Pretty good indeed. You certainly saw that standard manufacturing, at least with my loads, didn't do that and loads 
can affect that. A lot of guys will work up a load and get it to the point where for a particular gun, he's got a particular load that seems to perform the best in it. Um, and I'll work on some. And how you grip a single action revolver also has some effect on that as well. But I'm going to get this reassembled. That's my review. I bet you don't envy me having to put all these back together again. And now that I've got them all apart and they're full of a bunch of crud on the inside, I won't be able to put them back together again with any peace of mind until I completely scrub every little part down. So it looks like I'm up for a, a long night of reassembly. Thanks for watching.